Hi, I'm Bernie Lightman, and today uh, I want to discuss how British intellectuals engage with the issue of the relationship between ev evolution and religion within a global context. I want to ask, what did an understanding of the relationship between science and religion mean when intellectuals had far more opportunities in the 19th century to travel the world, experience new cultures, and read the works of thinkers from those cultures? British figures like T.H. Huxley and Charles Darwin, especially early in their lives, were not just beneficiaries of the expanding British Empire, but actively contributed to its expansion. Their voyages around the world on British naval vessels, encountering new cultures, prepared them to see themselves as a new breed of intellectual whose work depended on imperial networks and global perspectives. Either on their voyages or perhaps afterwards in Britain, they encountered non-Western ideas. But even those intellectuals who could not travel could participate in global debates about evolution by tapping into the increasing quantity of affordable books and periodicals on science, many translated into a variety of languages that resulted from the use of new printing technologies. Transnational and transregional intellectual spaces were created through different means, including travel, the circulation of knowledge, and imperial spaces. Intellectual spaces were no longer confined merely to the country in which an individual lived. In the 19th century, an exciting new global intellectual space emerged in which the implications of evolution for religion and modernity in general could be discussed. It was within this global intellectual space that evolutions, evolutionists like T.H. Huxley and Herbert Spencer explored the connection between evolution and Eastern religious traditions. They integrated those religious traditions into their evolutionary worldviews and used them to bolster the status of evolutionary theory while questioning the modernity of Christianity. James Secord asserts that Darwin was, quote, a characteristic figure of the first great age of globalization, quote. But there were many others in this age, not just located in Britain, can also be seen as characteristic of this age. By adopting this global perspective, we can avoid the often sterile reception model adopted by previous studies that don't do justice to the dynamic at work as global intellectuals grappled with the questions raised by evolutionary theory. This paper is intended to be a contribution to the growing body of scholarly work on the global history of science and religion. Incorporating the global turn into the history of science and religion began in earnest a little over a decade ago. Two publications charted a way forward towards a more global approach in the field of science and religion, which had for decades been consumed by the critique of the conflict thesis and the development of the complexity principle. In their pioneering edited collection, Science and Religion Around the World, published in 2011, John Headley Brook and Ron Numbers shifted a discussion to include non-Western contexts and non-Abrahamic religions. In addition to chapters on early and modern Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the collection offered chapters on early Chinese religions, Indic religions, Buddhism, African religions, and unbelief. Acknowledging that the field had been too preoccupied with Christianity's historical relationship to science, they attempted to establish a new direction that encompassed a global approach. Around the same time, in his chapter on a global history of science and religion in the edited collection, Science and Religion, New Historical Perspectives, Sujit Suvarasarandam posed a number of provocations for what a global history of this field could look like. Sujit argued that global history required a historical methodology based on, quote, the analysis of broad patterns and connections across space, rather than a comprehensive history of all regions. More importantly, his piece addressed the question of colonial encounters, stressing the fact that different intellectual traditions borrowed ideas from each other. These two publications <clears throat> represent two independent attempts to open up the historical study of the relationship between science and religion to non-Western religions. Both push scholars to go beyond the Judeo-Christian tradition when referring to religion. So, scientific naturalism, the circulation of knowledge and religion. Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, and Herbert Spencer, often referred to as the philosopher of evolution, were well-known British evolutionists who aimed to revolutionize how science was conducted and theorized. Their ideas on this topic contributed 
to the global circulation of evolutionary ideas. They were part of a group of reform-minded men who arrived on the British scientific scene in the middle of the 19th century. Besides Huxley and Spencer, the group included the physicist John Tyndall, mathematician William Kingdon Clifford, the founder of eugenics Francis Galton, the statistician and biometrician Carl Pearson, the anthropologist John Lubbock and Edward Tyler, the biologist E. Ray Ran Lancaster, the Dr. Henry Maudsley, and a group of journalists, editors, and writers such as Leslie Stephen, G. H. Lewes, John Morley, Grant Allen, and Edward Claude. Referred to as scientific naturalists by scholars, these men put forward new interpretations of nature, society, and humanity derived from the theories, methods, and categories of empirical science. Scientific naturalists were naturalistic in the sense that they ruled out recourse to causes not present in empirically observed nature, and they were scientific in that they interpreted nature in accordance with three major mid-century scientific theories, the atomic theory of matter, conservation of energy, and especially evolution. They defended Darwin when his origin of species first appeared in 1859. Huxley and Spencer were part of this influential group of British scientists, which aimed to use the debate over Darwin's theory of evolution to secularize nature and restrict British science to well-trained experts. In 1871, T.H. Huxley and Herbert Spencer, along with their friend John Tyndall, found themselves in the position of controlling the British component of an ambitious publishing project devoted to the dissemination of scientific knowledge in the Western world. The International Scientific Series, or ISS, was one of the most famous of all Victorian attempts to codify and popularize scientific knowledge in a systematic fashion to a wide reading public across national boundaries. The central purpose of the ISS was not just to disseminate scientific thought, but to circulate a naturalistic scientific perspective thoroughly informed by the science of evolution. Published over the course of four decades, it included 98 books, some published in five languages, English, Russian, German, French, and Italian. Six publishers from six countries were involved, and contributors were recruited from Britain, North America, and continental Europe. The ISS was the result of the entrepreneurial vision of Edward Yeomans, an American disciple of Spencer's, who worked at the New York publishing firm of D. Appleton and Company, with the support of Huxley, Spencer, Tyndall, and other British men of science, Yamans is able to create an international publishing project that could be used to increase the circulation of scientific ideas from one country to another. In addition to coordinating the efforts of the British branch of the project for Yamans, Huxley, Spencer, and Tyndall contributed books to the series. Tyndall has Forms of Water in 1872, Spencer has Studied Sociology 1873, and Huxley has Crayfish 1880. Huxley and Spencer's status as global intellectuals was not due merely to their participation in the International Science Series. Their perception of themselves as global intellectuals would have been due in part to how much they traveled to Europe and even farther afield. Huxley had served as assistant surgeon from 1846 to 1850 on the British naval survey ship, the HMS Rattlesnake, which took him to Australia and New Zealand. In 1876, he embarked on a lecture tour of the United States. Spencer was less adventurous, though he too visited America in 1882. But they were also global intellectuals because their ideas circulated around the world through the many translations of their books and articles. For example, Huxley's essay, Evolution Ethics, in 1893, became a key evolutionary text in China when it was translated into Chinese in 1896. Some of his books were translated over time into French, German, Chinese, Japanese, and Russia. Spencer's books, on psychology, biology, sociology, education, politics, and ethics were widely translated at different points in time into Russian, Japanese, Chinese, Spanish, French, Italian, Danish, and Swedish. However, both their role in international science series and as producers or disseminators of evolutionary perspectives to the world through the translation of their books draws attention to only one dimension of their participation in the global intellectual space in which they lived, there is another side to this story. It is important to understand their complicated attitude towards religion. The attempts of Huxley Spencer and their fellow scientific naturalists to redefine science brought them into conflict with the Anglican clergy and the older generation of natural philosophers and natural historians committed to conceiving of science as based on natural theology. 
But Huxley and Spencer were not anti-religious. Rather, they were hostile towards Christian theologians who attempted to dictate which scientific theories were acceptable. They argued that science should be autonomous and the legitimacy of scientific theories such as evolution be judged on purely naturalistic grounds. Separate from religion, theology was actually a part of the world of science as theologians made claims based on fact. By contrast, religion, properly understood as emotion and feeling, was entirely valid and could not come into conflict with science if distinguished from theology. In his first principles, Spencer even accepted the existence of a shadowy deity that he referred to as the unknowable with a capital U, which he claimed lay at the center of all religions. Huxley and Spencer worked to redefine the meaning of science at a time when the study of rel world religions in England was supposedly becoming scientific. They appropriated the Orientalist construction of world religions for their own purposes. Scholars have discussed their criticisms of Christian theology but have rarely noticed their interest in Buddhism, Confucianism, and other non-Christian religious traditions. However, Huxley and Spencer integrated non-Christian modes of thought into their articulation of evolutionary theory, so much so that I want to refer to them as Oriental evolutionists. They wrote about Oriental religions to emphasize the backwardness of Christianity, especially its hostility towards modern science. Oriental religions not only were more congenial to evolutionary forms of thinking, in the minds of Huxley and Spencer, they were superior because long ago they had already anticipated philosophical evolutionism. They were cr crucial for understanding the true nature of religion, the evolutionary process that had produced the world religions, and the evolution of human thought in general. I will examine Spencer and Huxley one by one to see how they arrived at this somewhat unexpected position. So now a section on Spencer and the evolution of religion. Herbert Spencer, the philosopher of evolution, was indebted to the sociologists and anthropologists who were creating a new scientific study of religion. He began to work on world religions as part of his research on sociology. In the course of preparing his Principles of Sociology, first edition, 1876, Spencer collected and classified large quantities of facts relating to societies of different types, ancient and modern. This work began in October 1867 with the help of several assistants and was originally intended as a preliminary data for principles of sociology, but Spencer later decided to publish the information in table form under the title Descriptive Sociology. Each of the 13 volumes, which appeared from 1873 to 1934, contained data on diverse types of societies at different stages of social societal evolution. Using a classification system that Spencer had developed. So, for example, the volume on China, published in 1910, was compiled by E.T.C. Werner, the consul at Fuchao. It contained raw data on Chinese ecclesiastical institutions and religious ideas through the ages. Table 9, covering the Manchu period, 1644 to the present, had a column on religious ideas that recorded, quote, religion domestic and centered mainly in reverence for ancestors, largely agnostic, brackets, Confucianism, bracket, end of quote. The assertion that Chinese religion was based on reverence for ancestors in descriptive sociology is an obvious clue to how Spencer and his assistants approached religion and the evolution of culture. Starting in the early 1860s, a distinct field of scholarly study flourished in Britain devoted to the scientific analysis of religious practices and belief systems. Known as the science of religion or compared religions or the history of religions, contributors came from anthropology, sociology, classics, and oriental studies. The key figures included James G. Fraser, Jane Ellen Harrison, Andrew Lang, Friedrich Max Mueller, William Robertson Smith, and Edward B. Tyler. Tyler and his theory that the origins of all religions and primitive culture, 1871, can be found in ancestor or ghost worship was particularly important to Spencer. During a controversy with the positivist Frederick Harris at the pages of the 19th century in 1884 over the origins and future of religion, Spencer explained how the facts given in his descriptive sociology demonstrated the accuracy of the ghost theory and disproved Harrison's assertion that in the past, humans worshipped inanimate objects. Spencer also referred to Tyler for support, stating that the anthropologists, quote, 
probably read more books about uncivilized peoples than any Englishman living or dead. Both China and India, Spencer argued, perfectly illustrated the origins of religion according to the ghost theory. In China, for example, the quote, state religion continues down to the present day to be an elaborate ancestor worship, where each man's chief thought in life is to secure the due making of sacrifices to his ghost after death, end of quote. Spencer then outlined his larger views on the evolution of religion. Religions begin with the idea of a spirit or ghost, then evolve to the idea of supernatural beings of all kinds, and then evolve into monotheism, in which one major supernatural agent becomes, quote, an omnipresent power to which no attributes can be ascertained, quote, which Spencer referred to as the unknowable. All religions, he claimed, undergo this evolutionary process. Spencer developed his theory on the evolution of religion in more depth in his section on ecclesiastical institutions, which was added to his principles of sociology in 1885. And here he repeated his point that the origin of all religions in the ancient past was the concept of God that derived from ghost propitiation. Spencer found examples of this everywhere. Mohammedans practiced ancestor worship, as did ancient peoples who lived in the forests of North America, in African jungles, in the Andes, in Polynesian islands, and throughout every other geographical location in the world. The widespread evidence for the ghost theory provided abundant proofs of the natural genesis of religions. Spencer then went into detail on the evolutionary development of the idea of God in China, Japan, and India. In both China and Japan, the eldest male descendants performed the proper sacrifices after the death of the parent and became quasi-priests. Spencer concluded this part of the analysis by declaring that, quote, the ghost theory, which explains the multitudinous phenomena of religion in general, explains also the genesis of the priestly function. Quote. This leads Spencer from the evolution of God into his next theme, the development of ecclesiastical institutions. Of course, they were part of the social evolutionary process. Quote, among social phenomena, Spencer affirmed those presented by ecclesiastical institutions illustrate very clearly the general law of evolution. And quote, for Spencer, this meant the development of ecclesiastical institutions fell into line with the general evolutionary process that moved from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous. Spencer pointed out that the evolution of science was a parallel process to the evolution of religion. Rather than undercutting religion, the development of science, quote, enlarges the sphere for religious sentiment, quote, as the proper study of nature led to a consciousness of the relation which we stand to the unknown cause. In a subsequent chapter focusing on man of science and philosophers, Spencer argued that, quote, in Christian Europe, as in the pagan East, the man of science and the philosopher were a priestly origin. But science and philosophy, at first a part of theology, gradually became differentiated, and then philosophy and science were separated from each other. So now let's turn to Huxley, the evolution of theology in Oriental religions. Like Spencer, Huxley's views on science and oriental religions reflected a profound debt to the new science of religion that began in the 1860s to draw on the anthropology, sociology, classics, and oriented studies. Huxley was deeply involved in the study of anthropology and wrote several key essays that discussed oriental religions. He served as the president of the Ethnological Society of London from 1868 to 1871. As president, he delivered the opening address to the society on March 9, 1869 titled On the Ethnology and Archaeology of India. Here he announced that the Council of Society proposed to, quote, direct public attention to the desirableness of subjecting the physical characters, the languages of civilizations, the religions, in short, the ethnology of the various peoples over whom the rule of Britain extends to systematic investigation. Quote, the ethnology of British colonies was important, Huxley argued, to keep the empire strong. Huxley announced a series of meetings, quote, devoted to the ethnology of one or other of the British possessions, end quote. And the rest of, addresses, of the addresses taken up with India, including the endless shades of diversity in its religion. Huxley's interest in India then began at least as early as 1869. But the fruits of Huxley's engagement with Oriental religion is to be found in two later essays. The Evolution of Theology, an Anthropological Study, published 1886, and Evolution and Ethics, published 1893. In the first rather lengthy essay, Huxley begins by proposing to analyze the origins, growth, and decline of theologies as an anthropologist. He treated theology as, quote, a natural product of the operations of the human mind, and, quote, akin to the development of architecture, music, or painting. 
Then Huxley began to examine the role of the ghost theory in the development of ancient Eastern religions and in the creeds of the old Israelites as depicted in the Old Testament. Huxley acknowledged that he did not create the ghost theory and refers the reader to three works. J.G. Mueller's Geschichte der Amerikanischen uh, Amerikanischen Irreligion, 1855, Tyler's Primitive Culture, and Spencer's recently published Ecclesiastical Institutions. The theory, Huxley asserted, is essential to any anthropological understanding of how all religions originated and developed. Quote, it is a matter of fact that, as he declared, whether we direct our attention to the older conditions of civilized societies in Japan, in India, and in, in, in China, in Greece, or in Rome, we find underlying all other theological notions the belief in ghosts. Quote, when he examined Chinese and Japanese theologies, he asserted that ancestor worship attained, quote, its acme in the state theology of China and the kami theology of Japan, end quote. The establishment of Christianity begins a new course of evolution, the steps of which he said are obvious and which end with the spread of true scientific culture in the modern period. Theology, Huxley concludes, has from the beginning of time offered religious symbols that are slowly refined over time. Science's role in this process is to occasionally warn of the ten tendency of thematic theology to produce idols that prevent the growth of new religious symbols. After the publication of the evolution of theology, Huxley began to use comparisons between Oriental religion and Christianity to confound his opponents. In Mr. Gladstone and Genesis, an essay published in 1886, Huxley rejected Gladstone's claims that the author of Genesis was either inspired by God or gifted with superhuman faculties, and that the Pentateuchal statement could be taken as a scientific document. Huxley argued that Genesis had no more scientific importance than the cosmologies to be found in the holy books of other ancient civilizations. He pointed to, quote, the evolutionary character of Indian philosophy, and especially of, of that of Buddhists, quote. Although Huxley admitted that he was not intimately acquainted with Indian philosophy, he claimed to have, quote, taken great pains to secure that such knowledge as I do possess shall be accurate and trustworthy. In his 1889 essay on agnosticism, Huxley responded to an insult hurled at him by Henry Wace, an Anglican minister and ecclesiastical historian. Wace might consider him to be an infidel, but Mohammedans would agree in, quote, reciprocating that appellation to Dr. Wace himself. Quote. Whereas Wace believed it should be unpleasant for a man to say that he did not believe in Jesus Christ, Huxley replied that it depended on whether or not the man was brought up in a Christian household. Quote, I do not see why it should be unpleasant for a Mohammedan or a Buddhist to say so, Huxley declared, signaling that he had a far more tolerant view of Islam and Buddhism than Weiss. Huxley's views of the relationship between evolution and Eastern religions are developed at length in his Romanist lecture titled Evolution and Ethics, 1893. It is easy to miss just how much Huxley engages with Eastern religions in this well-known essay. And scholars have read this essay primarily to understand Huxley's rejection of Spencer's attempt to derive a philosophy of ethics out of the evolutionary process, largely ignoring the sections on Buddhism. A lot of the interesting material in Oriental religions is buried in the extensive notes at the end of Huxley's essay. A major theme in evolutionary ethics it's the anticipation of evolutionary theory of Buddhism as an explanation for why it is more compatible with modern science than Christianity. The Buddhist and Hindu notion of transmigration, though Huxley admitted that his readers might find it absurd, parallel the concept of evolution as both had their, quote, roots in the world of reality and, the, quote, and therefore were scientifically grounded. For through the evolutionary process, the moral and intellectual essence of each person passed to another through heredity. Huxley even suggested the concept of karma, which allowed for the role of will and the modification of the individual, illustrated that Indian philosophers were strong believers in the Lamarckian theory of the hereditary transmission of acquired characteristics. There was, in Huxley's mind, valid scientific evidence to support aspects of Oriental theology. In the notes, Huxley acknowledged that the scholarly works that he had drawn on in his discussion of, of Buddhism um, were uh, things that were works that he had uh, read 
quite thoroughly, and he referred to the second edition of Herman Oldenburg's Buddha, published in 1890, and to several books by Rees Davids. Thomas W. Rees Davids was the most influential British scholar of Buddhism in his day. His works were part of a burgeoning interest in Buddhism in Britain in the latter half of the 19th century. In one note, Huxley quoted from David's Hibbert Lectures for 1881 on how Buddhism was unique in the way it emphasized how humans could reach salvation through knowledge of nature rather than knowledge of God. Huxley's embrace of this rather agnostic-like depiction of Buddhism was at odds with the conventional portrayal of Buddhism as atheistic. But, as Donald Lopez Jr. has observed for Huxley and other Victorians, Buddhism was a tradition that pictured the universe as subject to natural laws with no requirement for an intervening divine being, for dogma, ritual, or even scriptures. This Buddha became popular among anti-clerical European scholars. So Huxley was not alone in presenting Buddhism as the religion, as Lopez Jr. puts it, quote, most suited to serious dialogue with science because both postulated the existence of immutable laws that cover the universe. In his account of the history of religions, Huxley claims that ancient Greek and Indian thought converged on the same evolutionary position, and it is here that modern thought could take its starting point. Modern thought, this is a quote, is making a fresh start from the base once Indian and Greek philosophy set out, Huxley declared, and the human mind being very much what it was six and twenty centuries ago, there is no ground for wonder if it presents indications of a tendency to move along the only lines to the same results." Quote. So, in effect, Huxley was asking his readers to erase the entire Christian era from intellectual history as it inhibited the development of science, and to look to pre-Christian modes of thought as an anchor for modernity. Huxley was conscious when writing this essay that he had to abide by the restrictions of the Romanist lecture. Religion and politics were to be avoided. Before giving the lecture at Oxford in May of 1893, he wrote to the founder of the annual Romanus lecture, George Romanus, several times in April to assure them that he had observed the limitations placed upon him. Quote, there is no allusion to politics in my lecture, he wrote to Romanus on April 22, 1893, nor to any religion except Buddhism, and only to speculative, only to the speculative and ethical side of that. Quote, if people did apply anything he said about these matters to modern philosophies, Huxley said, that's not my affair. Huxley wrote again six days later saying that his lecture wouldn't be, quote, too much for the Don's nerves, quote, and joked that his wife had gone over the papers twice without once scenting a heresy. But there's no mention of a role for Christianity in Huxley's vision for the future. Buddhism emerges as a religion most congenial to modern science as one of the starting points for modern thought to build upon. Spencer and Huxley explored the theme of Oriental religions to reflect on the understanding of science, evolution, religion, and their own culture, and then disseminated their views around the world in their publications, lectures, and in the international scientific series. Drawing on the new science religion, especially anthropology, they outlined the origin and evolution of religion, starting with the ghost theory. As religious and scientific reformers, they were disruptive forces contributing to the redefinition of both science and religion. Their research on Oriental religions was a part of their attempt to reimagine science, religion, and their relationship. They knowingly made use of, Orient, use of Oriental religions in order to demonstrate the inability of Christian theology to engage in a constructive way with evolutionary theory, as well as science more broadly. The Oriental religions were considered by them to be farther along in the evolutionary process by culminating in an agnostic-like position, and therefore they were presented as having more in common with modern science. Exploration of Oriental religions provided a way of highlighting their religiosity in the face of charges of materialism and atheism. Strikingly, their conception of how religions developed implied that the principles of evolution had not been produced in Britain. Rather, they had a long lineage in Oriental religions, theologies, and philosophies. In the past, scientific naturalists like Spencer and Huxley have been seen by scholars as quintessential British figures who should be placed in the empiricist tradition. In this way of looking at Spencer and Huxley, their intellectual lineage was traced through John Stuart Mill back to David Hume and further back to John Locke. I have argued for some time that this perspective on Spencer and Huxley is too narrow since both were indebted to German idealism. In this paper, 
I've taken the additional step of exploring how both were global intellectuals who engaged with each Eastern religions. Both Huxley and Spencer approached Eastern religions as sociologists and anthropologists attempting to place the world religions into a larger evolutionary framework. They made extensive use of the theory of ancestor or ghost worship put forward by figures who contributed to the new scientific study of religion. For Huxley and Spencer, discussing Eastern religions provided a way to subtly critique the shortcomings of Christianity in accommodating modern science, which was tied to their attempt to create a new scientific worldview as a replacement for the older Christian one. Both saw non-Christian religions as more congenial to the evolutionary theory and to the scientific naturalist perspective. This is what makes them deserving of the label Oriental Evolutionists. Thank you.